think we may as well make a start. It doesn't look like there's too many people out still having tea and coffee. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Tava Olson. I'm a professor at the University of Auckland Business School and the moderator for this session, uh, which is competing through global supply chain management. Um, unfortunately, one of our panelists has had to send her apologies. Uh, Carolyn won't be here, so we have three distinguished panelists, uh, each of whom will give about a 10-minute presentation, and then I'll, I'll probably ask a question or two, and then open the floor to questions. So um, I'll introduce each of the panelists just before they present, and if you can hold questions, except perhaps some super clarification, but I don't think you're going to have many lambdas and mu's on your slides, so um, yeah, shouldn't need any clarification questions. Um, so yes, our, our uh, first panellist, so we're going to go in opposite order to what's uh, actually in the program, and I'm not going to read their entire bios because you have them printed in your program. I'm just going to give uh, the highlights. Um, so our first uh, panellist and presenter is Tim Charlton, who's a senior consultant at XAC Solutions, and I guess you'll tell us a bit about yep. XAC Solutions. <coughs> who's worked for over 10 years uh, in a huge range of industries, which again, listed in your program, uh, and in particular has worked in the past as a supply chain manager at Procter & Gamble. Um, but he's also the president of the New South Wales Division of the Supply Chain and Logistics Association of Australia, which uh, sounds very interesting. Um, and he's also asked that you don't take any photos of his slides, please. Okay, I'm so. Details. So. Yeah. Welcome. I'll jump straight in, everyone. Um, for those that don't know, I'm Tim Charlton. I, uh, I've been in the industry a long time, basically ever since you can say I grew up. Um, I've got my master's and bachelor in supply chain, and I guess this has kind of been my DNA. And I, I just enjoyed the space, and I don't think I'm going to ever leave. Um, I work for a firm called Exact Solutions. We've got offices all throughout Asia Pacific, um, and we've done work globally for many large organisations. Um, we specialise in supply chain consultancy and we also do industrial property that's related to the supply chain. So our sort of thesis, if you like, as a business is, you know, design what your optimal supply chain network looks like and then figure out from that what size and how many of those facilities you need and then go and get the right deal um, for the property and don't do them independently. Um, so just sort of a, you know, on a bit more an exact, we, we work with clients across many different areas of the supply chain, but I thought Today I would give you a bit of background or a little bit of insight into some of the work I'm doing um, with some of the, my key clients at a global level. Um, so the outsourcing is the logistics outsourcing space is essentially where I sit. Um, a lot of my clients are looking for solutions around how they can outsource risk but not control. And um, as sort of the logistics outsourcing space has you know basically gone for many decades, everyone's outsourced, outsourced, outsourced to the non sort of the core competency carriers or it's a transport company or it's a 3PL. Um, what's happening with large, large multinationals is they're actually losing a lot of control over the end or the last mile of delivery, for example, or some of the key tasks that enable them to flex up and compete with smaller, more nimble organisations. So for example, if you think about some of the small entrants into the market, like Amazon or some of these guys that have got more vertical integrated supply chain, they're starting from essentially scratch. They've got very good technology end to end. A lot of the large organizations that have had decades of outsourcing have lost a lot of control. And um, with that, a lot, a lot of them are starting to realize that they have lost a lot of IP and they can't actually flex when they need to flex their muscle. So with that, I'd like to share with you a key trend that I'm working with some of my key clients on, which is around transportation. So how do you actually have control over your last mile delivery? If you're already an established business, well into hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, how do you actually take back control very quickly um, on that last mile piece? So the, the key trend, if you like, that I'll dive a little bit into is the transport control tower. So essentially what a transport control tower is, it's essentially the process of making the entire delivery network visible to the enterprise. Um, and with that, it enables the organisation to reduce the complexity when they have to react if something goes wrong. So if you think about you know, a, a global shipping organisation or, or anything that happens on the water, it's very hard for an organisation to react if they don't know until the last minute or it's too late. And what are my a lot of my clients are actually finding is that the, their customers are ringing them or well, they're, they're coming to them with a problem and they actually don't know. So they're not on the front foot with their customer service. 
Um, so with this, a control tower is actually leveraging technology and the integration of outsourced partners into the operation. Um, and with that, they're essentially like an extra arm to the business versus an outsource and walk away. <coughs> so some of the key benefits are you're shifting delivery from sort of reactive, if you like, to proactive service. And with that, a lot of my clients are actually on the front foot with their customers saying to their customers, sorry, we are going to be late, but we're doing X, Y, and Z to make up for that. And you think about large just sort of industrial type um, companies that are managing projects, whether it's in, uh, you know, construction that's happening, and there's a lot of timelines or critical paths in the process. Giving that forward notice to your customer is like giving them a, a pile of gold. So they can react, they know, versus them screaming and then everything halts on their end. So for a real critical sort of project-based supply chains, this initiative is really having big impacts and effectiveness on their ability to actually help their customer um, push through with their own objectives. So some, some sort of key you know, results, I'll, I think, from some of my clients, 80% reduction in complaint resolution time, um, and they're on the front foot with their customers within 24 hours. So instead of trying to chase up multiple 3PLs to find out where this shipment is, um, they essentially know straight away, and they can respond to the customer and give them an insight, and then they can go and react and start working contingencies in their own business. So how sort of a control tower looks, if you like, conceptually, there's a lot of communication flows, and communication is the key. But I would say personally that there's five sort of fundamental components to control tower that bring the whole thing together. So the first piece is monitoring. So how are we actually tracking versus our plan? So because we're going to communicate the plan to our customer and they're going to make decisions and, pl and plan around that plan for delivery. So how do we actually know how we're tracking versus what we've communicated? And with that, technology is a huge enabler. So without technology, um, organizations have got manual spreadsheets. Like some of the organizations I walk into that are large multinationals that don't have technology at their fingertips. Um, they're running around, there's people with spreadsheets. No one really knows the, the one source of truth. Um, it's no wonder they've got no idea what's going on half the time. And with that, this is why they're seeing it as a huge threat, because a sort of a smaller, more nimble organization that's got a really integrated visibility of their own small operation, they just can give that service to their customer much more effectively. The second key sub-process, if you like, is notifying. So once we identify that something's wrong, what do we actually do? Do we want to communicate to a key stakeholder? How do we communicate to that stakeholder so that at least then they can respond and they can absorb that information in the right way versus them finding it out themselves? Once we've found something wrong, what's the process or how do we simulate a solution or a contingency for this? So does the organisation you know, urgently express something to them? Do they put it on a courier, send it straight there if it's really urgent and they've got stock for it? Is it something that's you know, a project, a sort of big program launch that's happening in a country and you've you know, missed the ship or the container, the transshipment is held up in Hong Kong for, for a week, what can you do to actually get freight from source plant to local organisation and sort of not impact the promotion lead times? And once you've done that, it's implementing it. And the key with this is that the control tower is in complete control. There's one, it's almost like a mini project lead, if you like, for a contingency. So if it's a really critical customer or critical delivery, the, the control tower is in complete control. They know what's happening with all the resources and they've allocated tasks to everyone to actually get it done. And the five, sort of the fifth pillar, if you like, is to actually complete a post-mortem. So why did it go wrong? What are we doing about it? How do we get to the root cause? And the interesting thing with the control tower concept is my clients are actually seeing that they can leverage the control tower operator to actually be more of a continuous improvement driver for the business, to actually feed back and sort of mitigate any opportunity for these to occur again. Um, and if you think about it at a global scale, um, one of my clients is actually taking this and setting up the processes, but then integrating all the control tower resources in each country into their own sort of you know, subcommittee, if you like. And with that, they can share ideas, they can work through sort of how they dealt with a contingency versus another site um, and really improve the process moving forward. So just an example of sort of shifting from you know, reactive to proactive delivery service. If you think about a typical incident, you've got the delivery and you've missed your delivery. Your customer rings you and all of a sudden everyone's frantically trying to find out what's happening. So with that, essentially a control tower is on the front foot. Once something happens in transit, bang, we know about it, we can react, we, can, we basically can decide what we want to do with it, whether we do communicate to the customer or we work out a contingency and actually get an urgent shipment to that customer. So if you think about conceptually what it's like, it's almost like you're on the front foot and you know what's going to happen before your customer does, and then you've got all the power around the customer service piece. Thank you.
questions until all three have spoken. Um, and I'll introduce them one at a time. Uh, so our second panelist is Trevor Campbell, who's the plant manager at uh, Campbell Arnott's, uh, where he provides the overall strategic and operational di uh, direction for the Arnott's hunting, hunting wood, obviously not from Australia, hunting wood facility, uh, where the center of, which is the center of excellence for R&D in the region. Um, which I think is very impressive. And he has over uh, 39 years of experience within the supply chain, particularly including logistics and quality. Um, and he does a lot with the quality management, continuous improvement uh, within the plant that he manages. Uh, so welcome, Trevor. 